Welcome to Bible Believers Fellowship and part one of our two-part study of the Church at Philadelphia, Revelation chapter 3, verses 7 through 13. This is the sixth of the seven churches of Asia, and as we will see, it is the last that would actually keep God's Word. If you are a Bible-believing Christian, this message is very important to you, and in a few studies later, we will see that this church at Philadelphia represents true believers who will be raptured and kept from the hour of temptation which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. We want to remind you that you can listen to or download our videos and MP3 audio messages by visiting our website. But now, let's go to our study of the Church at Philadelphia. Our text is found in the King James Bible, the book of Revelation, chapter 3, beginning in verse 7. Prayer you'll see in a minute. Uh, Philadelphia is not, we're not talking about the one in Pennsylvania. We're talking about the one in uh, Asia Minor. Verse 7 is where we're going to start. Revelation chapter 3. Go ahead and read that with me. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. I want to spend a few minutes on this verse. Uh, first to introduce you to the city of Philadelphia. Of course, most of you know the Philadelphia city of brotherly love. Um, phyla, uh, phylo is the word uh, it's considered most, most, not always, but most of the time used in the sense of brother, brotherly love. E easy for me to say. Um, you ever heard the Romans road that people use when they're witnessing to people? Did you know there actually was a Romans road? <laughs> and the Roman road ran uh, from the city of Troy through Pergamos that we studied already and through Philadelphia. So it was a main thoroughfare uh, in that day. And it was also uh, a center for some reason, uh, you know, I don't understand all that's involved in plate tectonics and all that, but there's a even to this day, large and frequent earthquake activity over there. Was it on a fault line? <clears throat> I said I, I didn't find the explanation for it, but I just uh, found the references to the massive earthquakes that happened over the years. But there's a steady, large tremor, uh, just a regular basis. They have large, what they call tremors. If it were to happen here, it would freak everybody out. But th over there, it's so frequent that they're kind of used to. It's kind of like California, only California doesn't have the kind of tremors they have here. So it's a, just an interesting little footnote there. It was also a center of idolatry. And um, by the way, today it's known as Allah Sher, which is the city of Allah. That tells you where we've gone from first century AD when there's a church there. And uh, this is Dionysus, and I put a fig leaf over top of him. Um, I just love how these uh, Romans and Greeks uh, make all their gods naked. And uh, we're, we're, we're taught then in public schools that that's okay. Nudity is okay because it's art. Um, it's not okay. That's a sign that there's something sick with a culture. <laughs> when they make their gods nude. And uh, we've had a conversation with some folks over the last few weeks. And we talked about this when we studied uh, Legion in the book of Mark. And we talked about the fact that nudity is hand in hand, public nudity I should say, is hand in hand with demon possession or what we would call devil possession. And uh, when Saul, the king, came under an evil spirit, he stripped his clothes off and starts to prophesy. Um, then uh, the, there's an instance in Acts where a man is running around possessed of the devil and naked. And you'll see that, that uh, a s public nudity and all this nudity, when you go into Kroger and you see all these Hollywood uh, actors, actresses, all these models naked and nothing but a thread on covering their basic parts, that's a sign of the influence of the devil and devil possession. 
And what you'll find is among those people who are putting out those magazines and putting out these movies, they're involved in the occult and many of them are devil possessed. And that is why you see that kind of thing. This culture was full of the devil, full of devil possession. And that's why you, when you go to the museums, that's the kind of thing you see out of their uh, art. And Dionysus was their god. They, every city kind of had one or two main gods that they worshipped, small g. And he was a sex god, basically. Um, this little god was worshipped with drunkenness and sexual perversion. Now I want to mention this again, I'll say this over and over when we mention gods, small g, idols. They're not fake. The idol is fake. But behind the idol is a devil. Amen. And behind, behind the stories you hear is elements of truth going back to the Nephilim and the sons of God coming into the daughters of men producing the men of renown. What does, what does it mean to be a man of renown? You're looking at one. The men of renown are those people. The Bible says so. It's funny, the Bible says they're men of renown, and then you'll see a Bible commentator who say, we don't know who they're talking about. Wait a minute, the Bible just said we do. The Bible says when you see these men of renown, they are the Nephilim. That's what it says. So that's their Nephilim that they uh, worshipped. And it says in verse 7 that these things saith he that is holy. In contrast to all the naked freaks and the false occultic devil worshiping, you have Jesus. And Jesus is holy. Jesus hasn't changed. Churches and preachers and Bible versions have changed. But Jesus hasn't changed. The King James Bible hasn't changed. Jesus is still holy. Jesus still hates sin, and Jesus will condemn those who don't turn to Him in faith, trusting in His death, burial, and resurrection for salvation. They will not be forgiven. Those people who reject Jesus Christ will stand before Him at a great white throne, and He is holy. And these sinners who reject the blood of Jesus Christ and His payment for their sin, they are going to stand, guess what? Let me go back and show you what they're going to look like here. Where's my little thing at? Right there. That's minus the censored sign. <laughs> That's how they're going to stand before God. Naked. Yep. Why? Because they didn't have the covering. And Jesus, the same yesterday, today, and forever. So this false Jesus, this fake Jesus with a small j, He's effeminate. I think he's going to eventually be portrayed homosexual. And the Antichrist, I believe, will then be the embodiment of that fake Jesus who he will not regard the uh, love of women or the desire of women. And there's no mention of him being with a woman. And he's going to embody this fake Jesus that's being preached in churches today. And they'll sing a lot of that fake worship music on the radio station today. You know the ones where they're singing about this Jesus who doesn't hate sin, doesn't condemn sin, doesn't send anybody to hell. He's all positive and he's real effeminate and he looks at you and tells you how beautiful you are and it's all about you and it's, the music's about you. That's, that's going to... I really believe they're going to sing that music to the Antichrist. Oh, absolutely. They won't have to change their format <laughs> at the radio station. And I've met some of the people who work at some of these radio stations. Some of these radio stations are owned by unsaved people and they're just trying to make a buck. We showed on our church Facebook page a few months ago a list of these Christian radio stations owned by uh, the Roman Catholic Church. But the music that they're singing in these radio stations, they don't have to do anything just like the Bible versions. They're already owned by Antichrist, non-Christian owners. And that's why you don't hear about this Jesus, the Holy One. You won't hear about Him. And uh, that's why if you got anything or you see any of this stuff that says Jesus is your homeboy, uh, the, the references to that Jesus dude, that's the kind of stuff that's coming out these days. And it's because their Jesus isn't the biblical Jesus who deserves respect 
They blaspheme. Do you understand that's blasphemy? When you bring God down to your level, that's blasphemy. That's the definition of blasphemy. Don't call Jesus anything other than what the Bible calls Him. God our Savior. Worthy is the Lamb. Those are the kind of phrases and terms you use for Jesus. Somebody buys you a t-shirt like that or something, just trash it. Because to Jesus, sin is no joke. And he, it says, he that is true. No, it's not what's true for you is okay, and what's true for her is okay, and what's true for him is okay. No, Jesus is true. That's it. Jesus is true. He said so. Uh, he, he's the only religious leader. The only man, I put that in quotes, because he was God in human form, who was and is faultlessly true. No lies ever told by him. No sin ever found in him. No distortion or deception by him. He is true. And he said in John 14, 6, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Look at this. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. There is no other way to heaven than through Jesus Christ. We can sit here and talk about all the little things that people like to bring up. It doesn't change anything. Jesus said this. You either believe that or you believe Jesus is a liar. Those are your only two choices. And I believe what Jesus said. That He is the way, the truth, and the life. And He that hath the key of David... By the way, we're going to come back to that in a minute because we're going to find this is that claim of Jesus being true and Jesus being the way, the truth, and the life. It's going to come back in another verse here in, in Philadelphia and it pertains to this church. But you've seen this, and we talked about it a few weeks ago, uh, him having the keys to death and to hell. And there's some who actually believe he's got keys uh, others who believe it's a reference to uh, symbolic of his power. Um, I think that uh, the second one is obviously true. The first one could be true. There's no reason why he wouldn't have literal keys. <laughs> but I haven't seen that yet in Scripture where there's actually a reference to literal keys where you can say it dogmatically. But this is interesting here because it says, He that hath the key of David... Turn back to Isaiah 22. I want to show you something that is very interesting pertaining to this regarding having the keys of David. Isaiah 22. In Isaiah 22, beginning in verse 20, it shall come to pass in that day that I will call my servant Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah. Now, this is a reference to a real man who is being used in this text as a type of Jesus Christ, Messiah. We'll see that in just a second. He says of this Eliakim in verse 21, And I will clothe him with thy robe, and strengthen him with thy girdle, and I will commit thy government into his hand. Let me tell you two things. First of all, Isaiah 9, 6, Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. His name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And then verse 7, which is kind of knocked off every time people use it, And the government shall be upon His shoulder. It's talking about the Messiah, Jesus. Well, that's what it's talked about here with Eliakim. I will commit thy government into His hand, and He shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. You see, this has never happened yet. Mm -hmm. And that's why we know this is one reason. Even without the New Testament, just reading this alone, if you understand what you're reading, you know it's a, a reference to Jesus Christ. And then it says, He'll be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. And Jesus is the Lion of the tribe of Judah. This hasn't happened. Eliakim died. So who's it talking about? Well, it's real clear in verse 22 and 23. And the key of the house of David will I lay upon his shoulder. You know, that's something that the keys to certain things. The king would give you a position and he would actually put the key on your shoulder when he was giving you that position. So he shall open, and none shall shut, and he shall shut, and none shall open. 
Why? Because He's the way. And look what verse 23 says, And I will fasten Him as a nail in a sure place, and He shall be for a glorious throne to His Father's house. In other words, uh, uh, by the way, before this was a guy named Sheba, I believe, up above. Yeah. He's a type of the Antichrist. He would be the nail that wouldn't stay on the wall. This is the Messiah, the nail that would stay to the wall. Back then, they'd take a big old nail and, you know, that's when they wanted to hang anything up, whether it was keys, coats, or whatever, they just put a big old nail. And how many of you have done that yourselves? And we go into the uh, kitchen and we got a couple of nails there where we put the, the leashes for the puppies and then we have a couple of nails there for the fly swatters. <laughs> and I've, I lived in the house one time, every time I got another key, I'd just walk up and go, poof, 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 and put another nail, you know. Nothing more aggravating, though, when something happens and the thing gets stripped, and then when you put it up there, it falls. And whatever it is you hung up on there isn't found. <laughs> and that's what is the opposite. That's the Antichrist. But Jesus is a nail in a sure place. Now look at all these references, these things that we read in that text. Uh, we're going to see in the next verse, verse 8 in Revelation 3, Go to Revelation 3 and remember what you just read in Isaiah 20 uh, and Revelation 3, 8. It says, I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee, what? An open door and no man can shut it. We just read it in Isaiah. For thou hast a little strength and hast kept my word and hast not denied my name. So the whole reference of these last two verses of the key of David and the door that's open and no man can shut all goes back to Isaiah. That's why read the Bible from cover to cover. Get familiar with that book. And as you read one place, you'll remember something written in another. And that's how God gives you the ability to understand the Bible. God does not just hit you with it. There's not a red pill and a blue pill. You can't sleep with your Bible underneath your pillow and by what do they call that osmosis. <laughs> that doesn't work. <laughs> what works? Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. The only way you can do that is studying the Bible enables you to rightly divide the word of truth. And as you're reading over here in Revelation chapter 12, it talks about seeing a woman with 12 stars, and the Roman Catholic Church says, ah, oh, that's the church. And you're like, wait a minute, no it's not. Back here in Genesis, that's Israel. But if you don't read Genesis, you won't know what Revelation's saying, and you might buy the lie. See? My people are destroyed... By lack of knowledge. Lack of knowledge. Lack of knowledge. We're reading a book uh, recommended by Pete Ruckman, War on the Saints. And by the way, get the unabridged version, the original. They got new ones out where they cut half of it out and take out parts they don't like, and they should, that should be illegal. But we're reading this book, and she is laying the, uh, the case out. And yes, it's a lengthy case being laid out because there's so much false teaching on it that Christians have to fill themselves with the Word of God. Being filled with the Spirit is only half of what you need. And what I always say is this. Jesus said, these words that I speak, they are Spirit and they are life. I contend, the only difference I have with that book is that you can't be filled with the Spirit unless you're filled with the Word of God. But being filled with the Word of God does not mean you're filled with the Spirit. Well, what does that mean? Well, I know all kinds of homosexuals and atheists who run around quoting the Bible better than most Christians. Mm -hmm. They're not filled with the Spirit, even though they're filled with the knowledge of that book. It has to be both. You have to be born again and filled with the Spirit and filled with the Word. And when you're filled with the Word and filled with the Spirit, those words are Spirit. And then you can tell the difference of, uh, of right and wrong, truth and error, and you can rightly divide the word of truth. Amen? Amen? Amen. All right, I thought I'd get that. What was it, uh, talking about Ruckman the other day, I was watching him, that he, he was kept pointing these things out, and it got quieter and quieter and quieter, and he says, Amen, I'll just encourage myself in the Lord. <laughs> <laughs> 
But uh, verse 8 ends by saying that Philadelphia, the church of Philadelphia, this is what we want to be. We want to be Philadelphia. As an individual, we want to mimic this. As a body, we want to mimic this. They have kept my word and has not denied my name. Folks, I hope it, you, you're totally aware of how rampant those two points are being denied by the modern church. Kept my word. First of all, God has given us His word. There's two ways you can not keep His word. Number one is by not staying true to the true Bible and ad adopting a false version. If you adopt a false version, you're using the Pope's Vaticanus Codex. The Codex Vaticanus, the Vatican Bible. You've rejected the true book and you've adopted the Antichrist book. That's number one. The other way you cannot keep His Word is just by sitting under someone teaching or when you read by yourself and the Holy Spirit's teaching you and you don't allow it to change you. You don't obey the Word. That's two ways you cannot keep His Word. Philadelphia stuck true to the Antioch manuscripts. <laughs> they had the true book. And they stuck to His words practically, in practice. He says, they kept my word and hast not denied my name. Look at this. Just think of this. Local church began, uh, and this is the first century, local churches began adopting tradition and allegorical, spiritualized interpretations of the Bible instead of the plain literal sense of God's words. Justin Martyr, the man we get the word martyr, martyr, the word martyr means witness. It doesn't mean to die. But it became uh, synonymous with dying for the faith uh, because so many of the witnesses, the martyrs, were killed. A man named Justin Martyr began this spirit spiritualization of the Bible right off in the second century. And that's, he was one of the first to replace Israel with the church. By and large, until the 3rd or 4th century, most Christians remained true to the literal interpretation. But I tell you what happens, along came this guy named Origen. Origen, down in Alexandria, Egypt, which, by the way, is where the Vaticanus manuscript comes from, and the false new versions come from too. He taught a Gnostic form of Christianity, and he spiritualized everything. He didn't rightly divide it. And that led him into all kinds of error, including him castrating himself. Nice. Um, well, then Origen was the great influence on Augustine. And Augustine, in his City of God, was the architect of the Dark Ages and the papacy and the false Roman Catholic Church. And what is amazing is, even though Augustine didn't have the sense God gave a dog, I'm telling you, he, he, can I say this? I hope I don't want to offend anybody. I'm just telling you the truth. You need to know this stuff. Augustine was a nut. And he, he thought sexuality was evil. I'm not talking fornication. I mean sexuality. He referred to his male part as a demon rod. Okay? Lady uh, actually put that on Facebook <laughs> this past week. And it reminded me of what I was reading that. I was like, I thought I was reading it wrong. And I was like, what's he saying? Yeah, why? Because he's twisted. Augustine, let me tell you, you never find Augustine giving you a testimony of being saved by faith. You read Augustine, you will not find where he gives a testimony of believing the gospel and being saved. He thought he was saved by being a member of the church and being baptized. That's heresy. That's a false gospel. Galatians 1 says you're cursed. I don't care if your name is Augustine or not. You preach a false gospel cursed. And then he cursed humanity with that trash called City of God which gave us the papacy in the Roman Catholic Church. It all started back here. But Philadelphia was one church who didn't buy into it. They remained faithful. This is interesting too. Uh, Noah Hutchings in his book on Revelation said, quote, Dr. John Wolverd in his excellent book on the Revelation notes that there were a few nominal Christians in Philadelphia until World War I, which was back 1914, 1918, when they left for Greece to escape persecution. That's pretty interesting because if that's true, 
Philadelphia was the last church to have Christians in, in it. It was the last city to have a Christian church in it. A small remnant. By the way, two or three are gathered in my name. That's a local church. So they had a local church in Philadelphia uh, right up to World War I, which is when all this, really, the apostasy started to set in. And now as far as this, when it says, hast not denied my name. Well, again, there's more than one way you do that. Number one, deny Jesus under threat of persecution. People say, deny Jesus or die. Or deny Jesus or we're going to scalp you. Or deny Jesus or we're going to run you through. Or deny whatever. And people will deny Jesus in that way. And that was going on, especially during the uh, reign of Nero. Jesus said this in Matthew 10.33, But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. Now you say, well, what, what if you're saved? Aren't you secure? Well, if you're saved, you're secure. But if you're saved, you will not deny Jesus. There's something wrong with you if you're saved, but you're so worldly that you would deny Jesus to save your skin when if you're saved, you know that death is nothing but a door to eternity with Jesus. There's a problem with someone who says they're saved and would deny Jesus. Jesus says so right here. Uh, you can also deny um, that salvation must be through His name. You're denying Jesus when you deny that salvation must be through Jesus' name. Uh, Acts 4.12 is the reference. Oh, wait a minute. No, I know why I did that. I wanted to give you the context. Acts 4.10, Be it known unto you all. See, was, I always say this points out, Luke was a southern Jew. <clears throat> he wrote this book. Be it known unto you all, and to all pe the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead. Not just any Jesus.